Yeah, right. If it wasn't the case, you don't know. You never said a cowboy hat down like this. You always said a cowboy hat down like that. Do you notice the slope on that hat? You never spoke a redhead burn Good morning and welcome to New Hope. I'm Brandon Best, the uh, construction worker of the Elder Board. That's how you can tell by my uh, awesome tan lines on my face. And uh, thank you for choosing New Hope this morning and uh, we hope you enjoy the service. We're, we sure are glad you're here. <laughs> Instead of our men's breakfast in May, we'll be having our annual event, The Big Shoot. This is an event that's sponsored by Men's Ministry, but it's open to anyone. If you've never been to a range before, that's fine. Just come along. We have a certified professional to help. Plus we have lots of range safety officers. We start at 9 a.m. and then we stop at 12 and have a barbecue lunch. So we'd love to see you out there. Come along and enjoy good fellowship and good food. Good morning, ladies. Our walking club meets on the first Saturday of every month. The next one is scheduled for May the 4th at 8 a.m. at the Dry Creek Trailhead at the corner of Sunnyside and Shepherd. So bring your sneakers and bring some water and get ready to have a lot of fun with the ladies of our church. Enjoy walking. On May 19th is our annual pastor feed. This event helps us to send the fourth, fifth and sixth graders to Heartland Christian Camp. This is an important camp for them. Last year we had a handful of sixth graders who were baptized here at New Hope who gave their life to Christ at Heartland. The way this event works is that we ask you to bring pasta dishes that we can serve for dinner. We also ask if you can donate raffle prizes that we'll be raffling off after the dinner. And then what we do is we sell you tickets so you can eat the pasta that you brought and raffle tickets so you can win the donations that you gave us. It's awesome. So join us on May 19th at 5 p.m. here at New Hope. Come one, come all to Carnival 55. Those of you lucky enough to be 55 and older are invited to the Carnival on May 14th. The games start at 11.30. They go until 3 o'clock or until prizes run out. 14 different games, lots of food, and don't forget the dunk tank. Dunk your favorite pastor with a good shot. Join us. We're hoping to beat the record of 200 participants last year. Come on down. Hi, on May 5th, the junior hires will be selling breakfast burritos to raise money for camp. Between every service, you'll be able to purchase a burrito for $5, and you can eat them here at the church or you can take them home. But please come out and support our junior hires going to camp. Okay, so next Sunday, don't eat breakfast before you come, all right? You can come, get your breakfast, come a little early. They'll have it over on the far side of the bridge and uh, have a breakfast burrito. They're going to be made right here on the grounds, all right? So, well, not literally on the ground, but, you know, on the property. And uh, you're going to love them, all right? And help a junior high go to camp. I'm going to send the sign-up sheets around. The thing on the top is Carnival 55. Uh, that's coming up not this week, but two weeks from now, all right? And two weeks from this Tuesday. Tuesday. It is uh, last year. We did it in June. It got a little hot, so we're doing it in May this year. Hopefully, it's going to be just a little bit cooler, and uh, you'll have a wonderful time with lots of food. It's five bucks. If you can't afford it, don't worry about it. Uh, just show up anyway, but it's five dollars for the day. It's all the food you can eat, and it's going to be carnival food. You're going to have tacos and hot dogs and corn dogs. 
nachos, and I understand there's even going to be some donut holes, uh, all right, <clears throat> homemade right here. So uh, sign up, all right, let us know you're coming and how many you might be bringing with you. And then the other sign up sheet on the bottom is for the pasta feed, all right. Uh, if you can bring a pasta, please sign up for that. Or if you can bring something for a raffle item, indicate that on the sheet as well. So thank you very much for signing up. How'd you, how'd you like the welcome from Elder Brandon? Okay, here's the background on that. Last Wednesday evening for our elder board meeting, the whole board had to show up an hour early, come in here for filming. Every one of your elder board members except one absolutely went brain dead as soon as the camera was turned on, all right? <laughs> it took six, seven, and eight takes, okay, to get that. So the laughter at the end, all right, was all the rest of the board sitting out here laughing at Brandon, all right, by the time it was over. So over the next few weeks, uh, you'll be laughing at other elder board members, all right, as they do their best to welcome you to New Hope Church. But it was a lot of fun watching them, and um, um, yeah, nobody did it in one take. But what, what did I forget? Oh, motorcycle. There's three on there. There's a motorcycle ride next Sunday, all right? If you'd like to ride a motorcycle, come to the 8 o'clock service. Park your bike out front. After that service is over, you're going to Three Rivers, all right, for a wonderful, uh, a wonderful breakfast up there. So uh, if you're going to go on the motorcycle ride, please sign up. It is on the, the back of the sign-up sheet there, all right? Let me, uh, how about last Sunday? Yeah. Easter Sunday. Was that not awesome? What a day. Uh, I'm still floating, all right? I'm still floating. Uh, the choir just did an outstanding job. I, th I hope most of you read the email I sent out about it. My big apologies to Allie Ford. She was so gracious. I left her name uh, out of the program as one of our choir participants. Uh, but it was, a, it was a record choir size. It was a record attendance. We've never had 1,045 people in three services here at church on Sunday. Um, I'll be honest. Usually Easter Sunday and Christmas Sunday, the offering sucks, it stinks, okay? It's usually the bottom of the year. Those two are usually the smallest offerings of the year. Easter was the biggest offering of the year, all right? So it was a record all the way around, so thank you guys. But that's not the best part. Good. There were people who invited Jesus Christ in their life. I can't tell you how many, but I know two for sure came forward and told me after, after two of our services that today I invited Jesus Christ in my life. So we know of at least two and there may have been more and that is the biggest thing that we can be excited about for Easter Sunday. So uh, it was just a great day. And thank you all for being back today. All right, it's great to have you here. I hope you take the opportunity and read all the things that are in the bulletin because I'm not gonna really highlight any more than what we've, we've We've already done uh, up there. Uh, I will say we haven't said much about the building fund, all right, since, uh, since January. And so just a, a quick little update. Uh, you all are doing great with your pledges that you made. Uh, we're, we're getting about $20,000 every month is coming in over your, for your three-year pledges. If you are new to New Hope over the last couple months, wonder what's going on. The, uh, this picture is in the foyer, big size, and underneath the big picture out there, uh, you will find a little red box in, in the side of that red box, you'll find these cards. These are pledge cards. And in front of that red box, you will find a brochure. And that brochure explains everything about that building project. We are wanting to build a new building over on the far end of our property. It will house our offices. And then a, a 90 foot by 60 foot multi-use facility where we can do receptions. We can have overflow services. We can just take care of a lot of things that we're not very good at doing right now. And so uh, if you want to know more about it, pick up one of these cards, pick up one of the brochures that's there. It'll explain it. You can go to our website. There's a place to click on, and, and I do a little video explanation of it. And uh, we are taking three-year commitments. You could do it all at one time, but a lot of us, we do better with a little bit every month over three years, and we're trying to raise $1.5 to $1.7 million. And uh, from October to December, we raised $1.2 uh, million in pledges. So we're two-thirds of the way there. All right, a little farther than that, and that's exciting, and we'll start talking about 
about this a little bit more in the coming weeks. And uh, But anyway, just an update, and thank you so very much. Right now, cash in the bank and our building fund is, uh, we're getting close to $700,000, all right, that's already cash in hand. And we hope to start the project sometime during the summer. We, we would love for it to be the 1st of July. Uh, the plans are with the county. Uh, they have all the plans. They're going through it. When we hear from them, we'll take whatever the next step are. But uh, just a quick update uh, on that. All right. Well, um, I need to do two. Th yeah, let me do prayer requests in just a moment. I may, I sent out an email yesterday. Anybody wear a Stetson here today? Okay, we got some Stetsons. I want to know how many X's you got in your Stetson. This isn't a Stetson, but it's ten. How many X's you got? Ten. Ten? How many X's you got? Five. Five. Okay. You get your choice. Seven. Seven? Oh. All right. Anybody got more than ten? All right. You get your choice. Clovis handkerchief. Clovis rodeo mug. <laughs> a book on Jesus, pure and simple. A fire lighter. <laughs> It'll light your cigars, okay? They say this is an extra large shirt, but it won't fit you, so I know you can't have that one, all right? I can tell by looking at you. Well, unless she wants to wear it. She wants the handkerchief. She wants the handkerchief, then by all means. By all means, there you go. All right. Oh, I forgot to say, and I, I, I did have a $10 gift card for Starbucks. All right, how many, how many stars you got in your Stetson? Seven. Okay, that's worth a Starbucks card. There you go. All right. Uh, there was a time, there was a day that, a, that, a, that, a, that an X was 10 bucks for every X. Then it became $50 for every X. Currently, if you were to buy a Stetson today, it's 100 bucks for every X is what you would pay. Okay? Just letting you know, I, I didn't buy, I, I, have a, I have a 7X. I did not buy it. It was a gift. <laughs> All right? Uh, and this is a Roy Rogers. It does not have any X's in it. All right? But anyway, I said I would give gifts for that, so thank you. Anybody buy a brand new hat this week? You bought a brand new cowboy hat this week? Okay, I get to save my gift. <laughs> Okay, let me highlight a couple of prayer requests now. Uh, my cousin David, uh, I've mentioned him the last couple of weeks. Uh, he's married to my cousin Shelly. He's in the hospital. Uh, he's been battling a, a mass that's been on his throat. He's had surgery. He's had chemo. Uh, he's had immune therapy. None of it has worked. And uh, he is not in very good physical shape. He is in great spiritual shape. Uh, he loves the Lord. He knows where he's going, but this is a very challenging time for him and for Shelly. So would appreciate you remembering to pray for them. David James is in the building with us. David, wave over there. I won't make you stand because you had back surgery, all right? Uh, he had two back surgeries during Easter week, and uh, they say they were successful. We're going to know in about two weeks, all right? Because he still has pain, different kind of pain than before, and it's supposed to go away in two to three weeks. And so uh, it's great to see him out today. Miranda Biddy gave birth to those twins that she was carrying for nine months, almost nine months, so she, and she's home from the hospital. Many of you may not know, uh, though M Miranda was pregnant, these are not her children. She was being a surrogate mom for a couple who could not have children, and so she ended up carrying twins, all right? And uh, uh, pardon me, uh, you're asking me questions I don't have the answer to right now. I, I, I got a 50-50 shot that she had one of each. <laughs> I will be right with at least one of them, okay? So, uh, anyway, but we're so very, very grateful for that. So those are just a couple of uh, updates there. Tiffany Jones has been gone for almost two weeks now. Uh, she went to Texas to see your dad who was sick after she got there. Uh, things got worse very, very quickly. They had to put him under hospice care. And uh, before she was able to come home, he passed away. And so she stayed for the funeral. Uh, so please be remembering the Jones family, if you would, at this time. And then Tom Riska sang in our choir Easter Sunday. His mom passed away during Easter week. We had her service here on Thursday of this past week. Thank you all for responding so quickly and, and meeting the needs of that reception. And for those of you who were able to be here, the support that you showed Tom and his family. So we are grateful for that, but continue to remember them as you pray, if you would, please. Uh, next service, we have a baby dedication. Uh, you all miss out on that. But Piper Claire Martin is going to be dedicated, all right? She was was, uh, uh, let's see here. I don't have the date she was born on here. 
but she is just about, what, six months old? And uh, she is a beautiful, I love that name, Piper. And uh, she is absolutely a beautiful little girl, and we get to dedicate her in our next service. I'm going to ask our ushers to come forward and wait on us as we have our morning tithes and offering. Would you join with me as we pray, and then we'll engage in our worship today. Father, thank you so much for your son, the Lord Jesus, and thank you for the incredible celebration we got to experience and enjoy last Sunday. Uh, thank you as churches gathered all around the world in honor, recognition, remembrance, worship of the greatest event that has ever transpired, and that is the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. He died as the payment for our sin, and he rose again to be the victory in our lives over the sins that we face every single day. So we give you thanks for all that last Sunday means to us. Thank you for the encouragement, the excitement that it created in us to have that very special time together. Father, most of all, thank you for those who discovered new life in your son, Jesus Christ. And now they go by the name of Christian, not because they attended New Hope Church, not because they did a list of do's and don'ts, but simply because they heard the message of who Jesus is and what Jesus has done for them, and they said yes. It is a gift of grace and mercy, and we are so glad that it is. We can't do enough to earn it, and we can't earn enough to buy it. We can just be humble enough to receive it and accept it. And thank you for those who did that last week. Father, thank you for what you want to do in terms of encouraging us today and challenging us in our walk with you. May we walk away from here, Father, with a, a greater sense of dependence upon you than we've ever realized before in our lives. We trust you with the needs that we've expressed here today from those recovering from surgery, from those who have surgeries pending, Lord. Just found out Dick Kelton is going to have another back surgery in, uh, uh, later this coming month. And so we lift him up to you for, for, for David and others who are battling cancer and going through treatment. For Dan, Lord, we continue to lift him up. We're so grateful for how well that, uh, that he and Irma and others are doing. And, and we just say thank you. Um, we trust you with our lives. We trust you with our futures. And sometimes this world throws us curves. And sometimes this world does its best to body slam us to the ground. And yet you say that all things, the good, the bad, and the ugly this world throws at us, all things can be used for good if we will trust you and love you. And so, Father, thank you for not only giving us the grace that makes that possible, but then you provide us with you as the source of our strength to live it out in our daily lives. We love you. We want you to be magnified in our midst. In the name of Jesus Christ, we pray. Amen. Uh, and Milo, you'll find out when you listen to the sermon, you picked the perfect music for today. Perfect music. Love it when the Holy Spirit does that. Uh, I invite you to turn to the book of Proverbs, chapter 17. I'll be reading a verse from there in a few minutes. Proverbs, chapter 17. I did want to take just a moment before I jump into the message to be personal for a moment. Sometimes you guys see me dress up like this during Rodeo Month, though if you see me during the week, it's not unusual. I dress the same way. Uh, I love Wranglers, and I love uh, cowboy boots, and uh, I love horses, as long as somebody else is feeding them and paying for them. Uh, had my own for quite a few years but somebody's, ah, he's just a city boy. Let me take you to my roots, all right? I found these pictures in my desk drawer yesterday, or to this morning, actually, very early. And I thought, okay, let me show you a little bit about, there's how I got started, all right? If you notice the uh, camera on the side, it says September 1959. Uh, that's my Aunt Pat and uh, my Uncle Joy, her husband was my dad, uh, my mother's brother, and uh, he was a real cowboy. He was the ranch manager for Gopher Broke Ranch. How many of you remember that ranch in Fresno? I got two hands going up, all right? How many of you remember a guy by the name of Guy Gardner? Okay, but he owned Guy Gardner Volkswagen. Gopher Broke Ranch was his ranch, all right? Uh, and it was out on Belmont Avenue, and my Uncle Joy and my Aunt Pat lived on the property, and my uncle oversaw his horses and his cattle. So, uh, that's, notice the shirt. That's a Roy Rogers shirt. Next picture. That's my sister, all right? She's gonna kill me for showing this picture. Uh, this is March of 59. It's probably the weekend before the rodeo uh, parade, all right? Uh, and my sister is so happy about being up, but uh, I got my hat and my six-shooter on already, all right? I mean, that's the first thing a cowboy puts on when he gets up in the morning. And next picture, 
That's when the cowboy's tired, man. Rough day on the range, okay? Rough day on the range. And then just to show you, it wasn't only when I was a kid. All right, next picture. That's my graduation from high school party. All right, all right. What I wouldn't give to be 119 pounds of romping, stomping, death, and destruction again, man. But uh, <laughs> whoo, th those were 29 ways. Uh, those have been gone for a long, long time. All right, but anyway, just thought we would have a little fun to start the day out. Uh, and it fits with a new series that we're kicking off today. Our thrust all year is still going to be on evangelism, but we're going to look at it from different angles. And the one we're going to take for the next several weeks is looking at joy and laughter. I think joy and laughter is probably two of the best tools that Christians have in sharing their faith. And it's probably the least used tool in sharing our faith is often, most folks when they think of Christians, the first two words that don't come to their mind is joy and laughter. And that's too bad. And we're going to take a closer look at that. Um, it, it was Monday. As soon as Sunday was over, I began to think, Tim, where are you going to go next? Uh, what series? What, what, what direction do you, want to, do you want to pursue this whole subject of evangelism? And I automatically, for some reason, I believe it was a divine thing, uh, said, hey, we need to look at, at the subjects of joy and laughter. And so in this modern age, uh, I Googled just joy and laughter. And to my surprise, I found this out. Have you ever heard of Laughter Sunday in a church? Me neither, until last week. The idea of setting aside one Sunday each year to celebrate God's gift of laughter and joy was new to me, but it really has a long, rich history in some congregations around the world. Laughter Sunday also known as Holy Humor Sunday, Hilarity Sunday, God's Laughter Sunday, Bright Sunday, or Holy Fools Sunday, <laughs> has its roots in a number of different Christian traditions. Churches, are you ready for this? In the 15th century in Bavaria used to celebrate the Sunday after Easter. What is today? Besides Rodeo Sunday, it is the Sunday after Easter, all right? And in Bavaria, it was called Rhesus Partialis. It means God's joke or an Easter laugh. Priests would deliberately include amusing stories and jokes in their sermons in an attempt to make the faithful laugh on that Sunday. After the service, folks would gather together and play practical jokes on each other and tell funny stories. It was their way of celebrating the resurrection of Christ, the supreme joke that God played on Satan by raising Jesus from the dead. You see, the observance of Rhesus Pasalis was officially outlawed by Pope Clement X in the 17th century. I think he thought people were just having too much fun in church. I've known people just like the Pope. In the Orthodox tradition, people would gather on Easter Monday and tell jokes and funny stories and dance and eat together. In 1988, a little more current history... A group called the Fellowship of Merry Christians, M-E-R-R-Y, didn't know there was such a fellowship. But they began encouraging churches to resurrect some of these Christian traditions to celebrate the grace and the mercy of God through the gift of laughter and joy. I never heard of the group, but I like their idea. We need more laughter and joy in our fellowship. G.K. Chesterton, a theologian, a preacher, a revivalist, he wrote once, angels can fly because they take themselves lightly. <laughs> Never forget that the devil fell by force of gravity. He who has faith has the fun. Do you have faith? Where's your fun? Fun, laughter, joy. Since it's Rodeo Weekend, how about just a little cowboy humor to set the stage? In a book I have in my library called Don't Squat With Your Spurs On. <laughs> it really is the name of the book. And 
I will tell you it is also very good advice, okay? It's very good advice. Um, the, the, let me just read a few uh, jewels of wisdom out of this uh, very wise book. Good judgment comes from experience, and a lot of that comes from bad judgment. <laughs> Most of us could say amen to that. After eating an entire bull, a mountain lion felt so good he started roaring. He kept it up until a hunter came along and shot him. What's the moral? When you're full of bull, keep your mouth shut. <laughs> a lot of preachers could profit from that one, let me tell you. This will be very true today since the temperature is a little bit warmer and it's rodeo day. This is one I'll try to observe. Uh, never kick a cow chip on a hot day. <laughs> if you do it once, you won't do it again. There's two theories to argue with a woman. Neither one of them works. <laughs> that was for you men that felt like I picked on you last week, all right, just a little bit. Never slap a man. Never slap a man who's chewing tobacco. <laughs> the quickest way to double your money: fold it over and put it in your pocket. Okay? Uh, that's only after the offering's been taken. <laughs> what sickness do cowboys get from riding wild horses? Bronchitis. <laughs> How did the bow-legged cowboy get fired? He couldn't keep his calves together. What do you call a takeout low calorie meal for a cowboy? A saddle light dish. Have you had enough? Okay, one more. A cowboy laid sprawled across three entire seats in the posh Amarillo Theater. Now, let me pause right here for a moment. I've been to Amarillo many, many times. There is no such thing as a posh theater in Amarillo. When the usher came by and noticed this, he whispered to the cowboy, sorry, sir, but you're only allowed one seat. The cowboy groaned but didn't budge. The usher became impatient. Sir, if you don't get up from there, I'm going to call the manager. Once again, the cowboy just groaned. The usher, realizing he's dealing with an impaired individual, marched briskly back up the aisle, and in a moment he returned with the manager. Together, the two of them tried repeatedly to move the cowboy with no success. Finally, they summoned the police. A Texas ranger showed up, surveyed the situation briefly, then said, all right, buddy, what's your name? Fred, the cowboy moaned. Where you from, Fred? With terrible pain in his voice, Slowly pointing one finger with great pain towards the ceiling, Fred said, The balcony! <laughs> I'm, I'm finished. Effective communication, though, is essential in circumstances like this, but communication with God is essential in every circumstance of life. You see, it's very healthy to follow God's directions. It's also usually healthy to follow a doctor's orders. After giving a woman a full medical examination, the doctor writes out a prescription and he gives her her dosages. He says, take the green pill with a large glass of water when you get up. Take the blue pill with a large glass of water after lunch. And then just before you go to bed, take the red pill with another large glass of water. The word woman asks, exactly, what is my problem, doc? And the doctor replies, you're not drinking enough water. <laughs> That's one of the reasons doctors make the big bucks they do. They know what medicine to give to cure our ailments. They have to know what kind of pills and in what dose to help us get better. Have you ever wondered when you watch your doctor write out a prescription for you, I wonder how many times they get it wrong? <laughs> if you do, change doctors. Okay. Uh, they probably don't mess up very often. We usually get back to normal health very quickly when we follow their prescriptions. This morning, I want to give to you a prescription. I, I know I'm not a doctor nor the son of one, but this prescription that I have for you today comes from one who is known in the Scriptures as the great physician. He gave doctors the knowledge and the wisdom to treat our bodies, but the prescription I'm giving you today is one for your soul it is a medicine that can help us live better and longer, both in spirit 
and in body. Best of all, the prescription I have for you will cost you absolutely nothing. You don't even need insurance to get it for free. What is this powerful free wonder drug for the soul? Well, it's found in Proverbs chapter 17, verse 22. Let's read this and see if this isn't just what the doctor has ordered for us today. That is the most beautiful sound in the world to a pastor. Pages in a Bible turning. A cheerful heart is good medicine. Another translation says a merry heart is good medicine. Another translation renders the verse this way, laughter is good medicine for the soul, but a crushed spirit dries up the bones. I don't know about you, but we live in a world which is doing its best to crush our spirits. We live in a world that every time you turn on the TV and every time you listen to the news, every time you pick up your cell phone, because if you have internet service, it's flashing you with the latest news stories. And again and again and again, it's bad news. Shelly and I had the privilege of going to the giant Yankee game yesterday and uh, the generosity of some folks in our church to make it possible for us to be there. And um, um, it was quite interesting. First off, let me tell you, there were almost as many Yankee fans in Oracle Stadium as there were Giants fans. Okay? Um, the Yankee fans were very nice. They were very quiet until Sanchez hit a grand slam, and then we all rose in unison and cheered, all right? Uh, but I saw many couples like Shelly and I, one in a Giants outfit and one in Yankees gear. Very conflicted relationships, very conflicted relationships. But, but we had a lot of fun. But as soon as we got back in the car and looked at our phones, you know what the messages were? Two synagogues attacked, people injured and killed. It doesn't take long in this world for us to get discouraged and feel like we're crushed in spirit. One of the keys to understanding this prescription in Proverbs, and by the way, Proverbs is a book that was put together, most of it written by Solomon, the wisest man who ever lived. What he didn't write are great pearls of wisdom from his father that he remembered, and others came from Moses, all right, who he certainly was taught about as a child growing up at his, in his father's home. And the book of Proverbs has 31 chapters, okay, 31 chapters. How many days are there going to be in the month of May? What would be a good idea for us to do beginning May 1st? Why don't you try reading a chapter a day? It's a prescription, one a day, all right? This is a one-a-day vitamin for the month of May for all of us. So start on May 1st. Let's all do that together, and maybe each Sunday we'll uh, talk about a few things, all right? Um, but this, this particular chapter, this particular verse, is God's instructions for us on how to live wisely. They're not just old sayings that somebody decided to record. These aren't just a collection of somebody's ideas of good advice. These are godly principles for living our life skillfully and successfully. And in this particular case, living a life healthier. With that in mind, we can divide this prescription to have a merry heart, a cheerful heart, for it's good for the soul, into two, two basic parts. Here's part number one. This will be the most profound thought you've heard in a long time. Loosen up. <laughs> Loosen up a little. Pastor and author John Ortberg from Northern California describes a member in his congregation called Hank. Hank was a cranky guy. He did not smile easily, and when he did, the smile often had a cruel edge coming at somebody else's expense. Hank had a knack for discovering islands of bad news in the ocean of happiness. His native tongue was complaining. Someone once asked, Hank, are you happy? Hank paused and reflected on it for a moment, and then without smiling said, yep. <laughs> Hank was a lot like our elders when the video camera goes on. <laughs> they just smiling and laughing. All of a sudden, Andrew turns the camera on, and boom. They're the saddest looking people in the world. It took one of our elders eight tries to get a smile on his face. He couldn't smile and talk at the same time. I won't tell you which one it was. 
I'll let you figure it out because you're going to see all of them over the next six or seven weeks, all right, at the beginning of every service. You see, Frank said, yep, he is happy, but somehow Hank's face never seemed to get the news. I remember when I was a kid, I thought, the first time I heard it, I thought it was cute. About the 20th time I heard it, and it was my dad on a Sunday morning, I thought, oh my goodness, dad, again? But sometimes my dad at the beginning of service would look out at the audience and he'd say, you know, if you can't say a word today, why don't you just... Yeah. And I couldn't figure out why dad did it so often until I started pastoring the church. <laughs> then I realized what he was looking at every Sunday morning, all right? They weren't <laughs> smiling at him very much, all right? So now I get the picture, all right? Tell your face that you're happy. Most of us have met a lot of, ha lot of Hanks or Hankettes in church. Many of them have been lifelong church members, deacons, even some of the pastors. My dad, Lonnie, smiles a lot, but my uncle Lonnie, who was a pastor, hardly ever smiled. I'm not sure what he's doing in heaven right now, but I think his face is learning to smile. Serious people who don't see much in life to smile about or laugh about, they come down with what I've now going to call the Hank syndrome. Others sometimes look up to these unsmiling, hyper-holy saints who take everything way too seriously, and they think they are so godly because they are so serious. Godly is not the term I would use for it. You see, most folks, particularly Christians, need a good dose of the medicine that is found in Proverbs 17, 22, where God says, a merry heart is good medicine. What does it mean to be merry, to be cheerful? It means loosen up some, folks. Lighten up. More specifically, it involves a couple of things. Number one, keeping a positive, healthy, biblical perspective. I, I, I use all three adjectives here because I don't want to just say a positive perspective because we sort of have grown up in the culture of the power of positive thinking. And, and, and though it's not a bad concept, the idea is, though, that you have enough within you that you can pull yourself up by the bootstraps and think positively. Well, you only can if your bootstraps are long enough. You only can if your will is strong enough. You only can if there's breaks in between all the bad junk. You see, being positive is more about being biblical because God gives us directions on how to survive when the times are tough. But you and I need to look at things from a biblical, healthy, positive perspective. I have heard the world can be divided into optimists and pessimists. An optimist invented the boat. A pessimist invented the life preserver. An optimist invented the airplane. A pessimist invented the parachute. An optimist laughs to forget. The pessimist forgets to laugh. Twixt the optimist and the pessimist, the difference is droll. The optimist seeks the donut. The pessimist sees the hole. Which group do you fall in? Are you optimistically, biblically healthy? Or are you pessimistically, unbiblically sick? In a world like ours that is full of evil and suffering and division and death, nothing is harder for many of us than holding on to optimism. But what, that only makes it more important that we don't allow ourselves to be consumed by the negative. God's prescription for lightening up doesn't mean we never weep or grieve. For after all, the Scripture tells us there is a time to weep. There's a time to sorrow. But there's also a time to dance and rejoice. If you do, don't ever weep or grieve, you are probably a very sick person. And if all you do is weep or grieve, you are probably a very sick person. There's some balance to this, and God understands that. What the Bible says to you and I is we need to develop the habit of keeping a biblically positive, healthy attitude, which consists simply of seeing everything the way God sees it. And how do you find out how God sees things? You read his mind. And some of you are saying, Tim, I can't read minds. You can read this mind. God reveals his mind right here. Read it. And you'll find out what the mind of God is on most situations you face in life. There is a principle of application somewhere for where your life is right now. But it doesn't happen by osmosis, folks. you got to open the book 
and read it. You gotta spend time talking to God. When you read something and you don't understand it, tell God, hey God, I can't figure this out. And then keep reading and keep trusting. And he will reveal what he means by the things that he says. Do you understand your wife's answer, men, the first time she gives it to you? The second? The third? No. Ladies, do you understand your husband when they see things to you? Yes, you do before they ever say it. You've, you've got them figured out. You do. You see, God does just not see the evil and the suffering and the death, but God sees how he's working in these things in our life to bring out the good in them even before the bad is finished. God doesn't just see his son dying on a cross during Easter week, but he sees his son's resurrection on Sunday morning. God doesn't just see the death of his saints. God sees them being welcomed into heaven where they will never die again. You and I have got to get our heads into our heads that pessimism is just not realistic when we consider the power of God to redeem any and every situation. Do you understand? Do you have the knowledge? Have you figured out the mind of God that in the current problem you are in right now, and I don't know what yours is, okay? Quite frankly, right now, I don't know what mine is. She and I were talking about it on the way home, man. Our lives have been so blessed. Not, not without its challenges, not without its bumps, but man, so blessed. But whatever issue you're in right now, God's got a redemptive plan for you in the midst of your mess. Instead of focusing on the mess, why don't you get excited about the redemptive thing God's going to do with the stuff that you find yourself in. And we find ourselves in this stuff sometimes because of our own foolish decisions, right? we made dumb decisions. Sometimes it's because those we love have made dumb decisions. And sometimes it's because of people we don't even know have made dumb decisions. But God says, I can take every single situation, and if you trust me, I'll redeem it. God takes the all things, Romans 8, 28, and he works them together for good. It's not the good stuff that turns out good. It's not the great stuff that turns out good. It's not the things I like that turns out good. The scripture says, written by a guy in prison, that God takes the all things and he works them together for our good. Here's the caveat. Here's where you gotta know the scriptures, the mind of God. What, how does it turn out for good? To those who love him and trust him. So if you want your junk to turn into jewels. If you want your crap to turn into blessings, then trust him and love him. Nothing more, nothing less, nothing else. Trust him and love him. If you need some help in this area, let me suggest another aspect of having a merry heart. It's, it's not only keeping a healthy biblical positive attitude, but secondly, it's, hey, learn to smile and laugh as much as possible. Plan to put things in your life that make you laugh and smile. Stop hanging out with people who cry all the time. Stop hanging out with people who every time you call them on the phone or you go by their house or they come by your house, all they do is complain and whine. Offer them some cheese. Hey. <laughs> I mean, but just, hey, if they want to, why are you hanging out with me? You know what, I need to laugh more. And you, I'm sorry, but you're not helping me laugh more. You might be doing them some good. Someone's once said that laughter is life's lubricant. It's like oil in an engine. It keeps things running better. This verse seems to agree with that idea in Proverbs 17, 22. A merry heart is a heart with a smile, a heart that loves to laugh. This verse is telling us that it's healthy to laugh because it's part of God's word. I want to even suggest to you that God is telling us it's kind of a holy thing to laugh. The Bible tells us in places like Psalm 2, 4 that God himself laughs. 
And that really shouldn't surprise us. The world that he created is a rather funny place. Go to the zoo and watch some of the animals. Or go to a mall and watch some of the people. <laughs> or if that fails, go in your bathroom and look in a mirror. <laughs> Full length one. Right out of the shower. If that doesn't make you laugh, I don't know why well. Of all the creatures that God has created, only human beings have the capacity to truly laugh. I mean, can you imagine what your dog and cat would do if it could laugh? In the way it's seen you at various occasions. Can you imagine what a cat would say when its human master gets down there? Oh, cool. So sweet. Is this dumb human talking to me like I'm a baby? <sighs> of course not. That's, I like that laugh. That's a good one. All right. I must have, I'm, I'm, I just made every cat lover mad at me. I am so sorry. <laughs> not all laughter is holy. I, I recognize that. There's balance to this. And the Bible warns us about humor that is harmful. It says, you and I should not fall into filthiness nor foolish talking or coarse jesting, which is not fitting, but rather we should be engaged in giving thanks. Paul writes that in Ephesians 5.4. There are some things we ought not to laugh at or about. But at the same time, I think it's high time that you and I understand that laughter is not evil or sinful. It is indeed a gift from God, a reflection of the very nature of God. It's good for us. According to a study conducted by the University of Maryland in Baltimore, by Dr. Michael Miller, laughter releases chemicals into the bloodstream that relax the blood vessels and reduces blood pressure and heart rate. Miller, who is the director for the Center of Preventative Cardiology at the university, interviewed 150 patients who had suffered heart trouble and 150 patients who had not. Each patient was asked questions to measure their response to typical day-to-day -day situations in life. The results showed that individuals with heart problems were 40% less likely to respond with laughter. Once again, science has finally caught up with the Bible. But have you and I? Are we laughing enough? You see, the great physician's prescription involves you and I learning to loosen up a little, keep a healthy, biblical, positive perspective on life, to smile and to laugh because he is the God of redemption. That's a healthy thing to do, but it's also a holy thing to do. Did you come here a little uptight today? Then loosen up some. Ask God to help you develop a more biblically based, positive, optimistic attitude, and then for goodness sakes, smile. It might lead to laughing. Enjoy this gift that God has given to us. A lady had a problem with dry hair, and she read in a magazine that olive oil could help. So she treated her scalp with a lot of olive oil before washing it. Worried that the oil might leave an odor, she washed her hair several times with her regular shampoo. That night when she climbed in bed, she leaned over next to her husband and said, do I smell like olive oil? He leaned back over and said, no, do I smell like Popeye? <laughs> Okay, did you get that? Okay, all right, just, just, just make it, you, you know who, Pop, Popeye's not the chicken place, all right, all right, yes, okay, all right, just make it. I'm getting older, you know, and they don't always, no. Then, then keep in mind the second half of this prescription. The first one is loosen up. The second thing this verse tells us is don't carry the weight of the world on your shoulders. It will crush your spirit. It'll squeeze the life right out of you. This morning's song, I couldn't believe it when we sang it a few minutes ago. Who could carry that kind of weight? I ran out of that grave. You and I can't carry the weight of, of this life on our shoulders. It, it kills us until we are liberated by the, the risen life of Jesus Christ in us. This scripture tells us that we get weighed down by worry and sorrow and guilt and discouragement. The scripture says that's unhealthy. The problem is, how do we deal when our spirit is already crushed? May I make a few suggestions? Number one, limit your load. 
You cannot go through life bearing some burdens of responsibility and concern for your own life, much less the lives of others around you. It's not your job to carry the load. There are a lot of weights which you and I were never, ever meant to carry. And let me highlight a couple of those. The three most common weights that folks carry that we shouldn't is guilt. If you are a Christian, you should not carry daily the weight of guilt in your life because of your previous bad actions. If you were a drug user or a drunk, God has freed you. Don't identify as a drunk and a drug user anymore. You're a new creation in Christ Jesus. Old things have passed away. All has become new. You had a baby, you gave up because you were too young and foolish and a mess. Don't live in guilt over the best decision you could make at a lousy time in your life. You, you ever had an abortion? Don't live in the guilt of what ifs. If you're a Christian and you've confessed all your sin to the Lord and you don't have to go and label every single one of them, but if you simply lay the burden of all your sin before the Lord, that's what he died on a cross to take care of. I want you to write this verse down if you don't know it and learn to memorize this verse. I don't care how old you are. Romans 8.1. Romans 8.1 is the remedy for carrying guilt in your life. Paul wrote it like this. Therefore, there is when? Now. Not later, not tomorrow, not in the future. There is therefore now no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus. It's gone. Guys, quit living carrying the burden of your guilt. Dump it. Get rid of it. Throw it away. It is trash. It is not who you are. It does not define what you are. Jesus did that on the cross. And we are now guilt-free. We shouldn't carry the burdens of worry. There are no legitimate concerns in life. Let me say that differently. There are some legitimate concerns in life, things that we should be prepared for, but when that concern crosses the line into worry, then we are carrying a load God never intended us to carry. Jesus' own words in Luke chapter 12, 22 to 26 goes like this. Then Jesus said to his disciples, therefore I say to you, do not worry about your life. Pause. What do you not understand about that sentence? What, what did Jesus leave out that it's okay for you to worry about? Do not worry about your life. Should you worry over the fact that you're single? No. Should you worry about the fact you're married? <laughs> Maybe. It's <laughs> kidding. Just kidding. We're laughing today, remember? We're laughing today. This is joy, okay? Mm. I'm sick. I'm sick. Should I worry about that? I'm dying. What is there? He, he says, do not worry about your life. It's pretty, don't, don't, and then he, for those of us who can't figure it out, he sort of gives us some examples. He says, don't worry about what you eat. How many of you are worried right now about where you're going for lunch as soon as I shut up? <laughs> don't worry about your body, what you will put on it. How many of you stood for five minutes in your closet this morning figuring out what you're going to wear? He said, life is more than food and the body is more than clothing. Consider the ravens, for they neither sow nor reap. They don't have a storehouse or a barn. God feeds them. Of how much more value are you than the birds? And let me just pause right here and get this off my chest. Guys, if you know me very well, you know I love my dogs. I've had several and I'm looking for another one. You know I've learned to like one cat, okay? Herndon, all right? I still have him. Okay, still got him. I love creation. We're living in a time and a culture which is trying to elevate the animal kingdom to equality or beyond equality with human beings. 
They are part of the animal kingdom, not made in the image of God. And if don't take my word for it, take Jesus' word for it. Because right here he says, how much more value are you than birds? And that applies for dogs, cats, horses, lions, cheetahs, monkeys, whatever other animal you want to put in there. Doesn't mean we abuse them, but we need to understand their place you and I are made in the image of God. Jesus Christ did not die on the cross for the animal kingdom. Jesus died on the cross for those who had committed sin against him, and that's those made in his image. And which of you, by worrying, can add one cubit, one inch to their height? Notice what he did not say. He didn't say you couldn't add an inch to your girth. He said, you can't add an inch to your height. We can. So if you can't do anything about that, then why are you anxious about other things in life? Jesus isn't saying you ought not to work for a living, that you ought not to, to take care of the things, of the needs in your family. What he's saying is that when you do all you can, and that starts by knowing his mind on matters in life, don't focus your mind on what or might not happen. Don't dwell on all the catastrophes that could be. Don't carry around the weight of worry. If you've been here a while, you've heard me tell the story, and I'm going to give you the brief version today because I need to wrap up in about four minutes. But my greatest example of this was from a dear, sweet old lady in our church, Vita Fry. Before Vita Fry moved to Fresno, when she moved from Oklahoma, she settled in Tulare. Her and her husbands were charter members of a church there, and their son, Gene Fry, became one of our family's best friends. He was a drunk until one day he ran into my dad at the Greyhound bus depot, and a series of transform transformative things happened, and Gene became part of our family. One night after dad had retired and I'd become pastor, it was a Sunday night after church. I'd got home, changed my clothes, just relaxing for the evening. It's Gene Fry, and he called. He said, Tim, I need to come pick you up. He said, my brother's taking his own life in my mother's house. I need you to go with me. He came by and picked me up. We hot-footed it down to, uh, down to Delary. We get there before the coroner even got there, and, and in the bedroom of his mother's house, a 50-plus-year-old man took a gun and put it to his head and took his own life. So after the coroner leaves and everything is settled down, it's Vida and her pastor and Tulare, a good friend of our families, and, and Gene and I. And, and Gene looks at his mom and said, Mama, are you ready to go to bed? And she said, yes, and I think I am. He said, you need me to call your doctor and maybe he can send something to the pharmacy and help you sleep tonight. Listen to her words. She said, oh, son, I don't need anything to help me sleep tonight. I will sleep tonight the way I have every other night since I've given my life to Jesus Christ. I will lay my head down on my pillow. I will thank my heavenly Father for his grace in my life. And if it's his will, I will rise in the morning and I will give him thanks for his sufficiency for the next day. And she tootled off down the hallway to her bedroom and Jean went and checked on her five minutes later and she was sound asleep. Oh, there is a woman who's learned not to carry the load of grief and worry, but to trust the Lord who said, I'll be your strength in a time of trouble. The last load we're not supposed to carry, but it's common for us, is grief. Every heart in this world is eventually broken. Our heart may break over a lost love, over loneliness, over sickness or death. Grief is a part of what it means to live in this fallen world. It's not wrong to weep when we hurt or grieve when we lose, but we can't stay there. We are not supposed to carry the weight of grief all of our life. It will crush us. The Bible says there is a time to weep, but not all the time. At some point, we move past the hurt, past the pain, past the lot, and we go on living. Don't get crushed by the weight of grief. And all that sounds good, but you're saying, Tim, how, how, how can I lose my guilt? How can I overcome worry? How do I get over my grief? I'm glad you ask. The Bible gives us a beautiful answer to this question. Roll your burdens to the Lord. When we try to carry our burdens, they're too heavy for us. We'll be crushed and beaten down every time. Our bones will be crushed. Our shoulders were not designed to bear these kind of burdens, but the shoulders of our Savior they were designed to carry our burdens. The Bible says when Jesus hung on the cross, he bore the weights that you and I cannot carry. Isaiah 53, 4, he has borne our griefs and he has carried our sorrows. 
The Savior who died also rose again, and he now sits on the right hand of God in heaven, and he says, there's no need for you to carry that guilt. I carried all the guilt of your sin to the cross. There is no need for you to carry the weight of worry. If I loved you enough to die for you, surely I love you enough to care for you. There is no need for you to carry the weight of grief. If you will come to me, I will come for your heart. I will dry your tears. Matthew eleven twenty eight 28 says, come to me, all you who weary and are burdened down. I will give you rest. A preacher was busy in his study while his little boy looked at a book of pictures. He suddenly wanted a very large reference book that was upstairs. And so he asked his son, son, would you run up there and grab me that big book on my desk and bring it down? The little boy was gone for a long time. And then the father heard the sound of sobbing on the stairs. He got up and went into the hallway and he looked up at the top of the staircase. He saw his son crying bitterly and the large book laying on his lap. And the little boy said, oh, daddy, I'm so sorry. I can't carry it. It's too heavy for me. In a moment, the father was up the stairs, stooping down. He picked up both the book and his son in his arms, and he carried them both back to the room below. And that, the preacher figured out, is how God deals with his children. When we just admit that we can't handle it, the father comes, and he carries both us and the burdens. What burdens did you come here carrying this morning? What's stopping you from laughing and rejoicing? Why don't you give it to him? If you've never given him your sins, why don't you do that this morning? If you haven't given him your worry, your grief, why don't you do that today? Proverbs 30, 11 says, You have turned for me my mourning into dancing. You have taken my sackcloth, and you've given me the new garment of gladness. This is God's prescription for you and I. We have a choice to take it, and get better, or refuse it, and get worse. Choice is ours. What will you choose today? Just before I pray, I'm going to give you an assignment. One, May 1st, start reading Proverbs every single day, one chapter a day. Number two, you come across a funny story, send it to me, email it. I'm looking for things. Number three, you're going to be amazed at how many verses talk about joy and laughter in the Bible, and we're going to look at several more of them in the weeks to come. And uh, why don't you on your own just begin to do a little research and find out what the Bible says about joy and laughter. Don't wait for me to feed you when you get here. Do a little feeding of your own before you show up. I think you might be fascinated with what you'll discover about joy and laughter in the Bible. Let's pray. Father, I love you. Sin is serious business. But forgiveness is joy-filled. Hurts and pain try to steal our joy. But forgiveness, fresh starts, redemption should put a smile on our face. So, Father, help us to understand your mind better so we reflect your attitude of joy and rejoicing and laughter even more often. Thank you. In Jesus' name, amen. God bless you. Have a great day and laugh a little.